There are a number of different kinds of games we're going to examine. Some of them are games where everyone can win, or conversely, everyone can lose. There are other games where really one person's gain is another person's loss. So we're going to be talking about zero-sum games, also constant-sum games. Actually, a zero-sum game is simply a special case of a constant-sum game. The idea is no matter what <laughs> is the result of the play of the game, there's a fixed quantity to be allocated among the players. If that quantity is zero, that is to say if one person gets a positive result only to the extent that other people get a negative result, it's a zero-sum game. But sometimes, as in typically budget negotiations, it's a constant-sum game. We know what the total of the budget is, and then different groups, let's say, fight over their part of the pie. And in that case, we have a constant-sum game. Something like that may take place even between married couples who are, asked, who are you know, trying to define, divide up the pie, or the bottle of wine, or the amount of, you know, the entree that each will consume, whatever. Anyway, the thought is, here you have a fixed sum, and it's a question of allocating that fixed sum among the players. But there are also games that can be mutually beneficial, or for that matter, mutually destructive, where the outcome can vary. So there are plays that lead to a larger sum for all of us, there are plays that lead to a smaller sum. Let's talk more about zero-sum games and constant-sum games, where the total amount is fixed and it's a question of allocation among the players. Each player's gain or loss is balanced by a loss or a gain on the part of other players. So if I get more of the budget, you get less, for example. The total amount of utility, the total amount in the budget, let's say, remains unchanged. Now these games are strictly competitive. My gain is your loss. Your gain is my loss, if there are only two of us anyway. And so these are competitive games. People compete for their share of the pie, for their part of the budget, and so on. These naturally create conflict. They are raising questions of distributive justice. How do we divide this much among the various people? And often people think about distributive justice in society at large as a matter of this kind of constant sum or zero sum game. That's actually highly misleading because the rules we use for allocation are going to affect the behavior of the players and that might enlarge the total amount of wealth, for example, in a society. It might contract it. It might keep it more or less the same. So really, an economy is nothing like a zero-sum game or a constant-sum game. But a budgeting situation within a family or within an organization may well be this sort of constant-sum game. For that matter, on a football field, you might think that what we've got, at least in a given set of plays, in a given drive, is really a question of a zero-sum game. I might start on my own 25-yard line. Every advance I make toward your goal pushes you back. So if I gain 15 yards, you've in effect been pushed back 15 yards. One team's gain is the other team's loss. So what are some examples of constant sum games? Some of them zero sum, some of them not. It often depends how we think about a game, whether it looks zero sum or constant sum. And so I'm not going to worry too much about that distinction. Here's one, oil and gas licensing. We're deci deciding who gets a license to drill for natural resources in a certain territory. Well, one company is getting the license precludes others from having that license. And so that's a good example. Promotions. There might be one person who's going to be promoted up to the next level. The various people who are competing for that promotion are all in a zero-sum game or a constant-sum game, if you want to think of it that way. One person is going to get that promotion, and it's simply a question of allocation of who it's going to be. Budgeting, as I've already mentioned, is like this. Real estate negotiations are like this. If I am paying less for the house, that means, well, it's a gain for me, but it's a loss for the seller of the house. And so you might say it's a question of how much money gets transferred. And in general, it's not just real estate transactions, but in buying and selling. What comes out of one person's pocket goes into the other person's pocket. The amount of money does not change as a result. It's a constant sum, or if you want to think of it that way, a zero-sum game. The same thing is true in elections. One candidate's victory is another candidate's loss. 
In bargaining, it's often like that. It doesn't matter whether we're negotiating about real estate or about something else. My getting a lower price means, well, <laughs> I gain that money, but you lose that money. Contracts are the same way. We're setting up negotiations around contracts and we're going to be agreeing to do a certain amount of work, for example. Well, if I agree to do more work, that's something that comes out of my effort, but it's your gain. And then market share is like this. Different companies are competing for market share. One company's gain in market share has to be compensated by a loss in market share from the others. Now, of course, the amount of the market doesn't remain constant. We may do things to expand the market or to contract the market. And so the market as a whole is something that can change. However, if we're thinking about percentages, the market share is something that is constant sum. In a mutually beneficial game, on the other hand, players can increase or decrease the total amount of utility. One player's game doesn't necessarily entail someone else's loss. It might be that we can both win or we can both lose. So we can have win-win situations. We can have lose-lose situations. Well, what are some examples of mutually beneficial games? Anytime it's possible for us to cooperate, or to put it in the negative way, collude, we can have a mutually beneficial or a mutually destructive game. Cartels are a good example. Medical records are an example where it might be that by providing certain information, it's not that I lose the information, right? It might be that I gain by having that information out there available to any doctor who treats me, and the doctor gains by having more information and making better decisions. So, Setting up a system of sharing medical records may be something that benefits patients and doctors. Student-professor interactions are often like this. There are ways in which professors and students can behave cooperatively so that both gain. The class is a better class, making it better for the professor and better for the students. Or it can be handled destructively in a way that's worse for the professor and worse for the students. We've got to be aware of third-party effects in general. So we pass a certain law. It restricts, let's say, people's freedom in a certain way, but that may be beneficial overall if people now find it easier to attain their ends. It may be destructive if it's a bad law. And we've got to think not only about the parties involved in actually passing this law, but anybody else who might be affected by that law. And it is, after all, going to apply to people whether they're part of the initial agreement or not. The same thing is true of morality. Moral rules constrain people just as much as legal rules do. Well, <laughs> maybe not as effectively or maybe sometimes more effectively. But the idea here is that the moral rule is something that typically is constructed in such a way that it's mutually beneficial for all of us if we all are constrained by those rules. And then finally, we can talk about coercion. Coercion is something that affects the person who is doing the coercing also the person being coerced, being forced into something. But other people may be affected too. Someone who robs someone else on the street at gunpoint, let's say, is not only affecting themselves and the person who's being robbed, but then information about that interaction affects the way other people act. 